Hi everyone, I hope you're all doing great and today I would like to tell you a little bit about periodic trajectories in billiards and what we know on finding them. So let me first explain what this means. So I'm looking here at the motion of a particle without friction in a certain domain of the plane and today this domain is going to have a convex boundary and the boundary should have no corners. So here I have drawn a nice smooth curve and here I have a trajectory of my particle and let's assume that it does the following thing. So whenever it hits the boundary I have an elastic collision so this angle should be equal to this one, this angle should be equal to this one, this angle should be equal to this one and uh, as I've drawn in this example, the particle actually returns to the same position and with an angle which is such that after the next collision it will again start in exactly the same direction. So it will keep cycling forever. So that is what we call a periodic trajectory and in this particular example it has period 3. Now uh, why is this useful? So one reason is that periodic trajectories, okay, mostly those that have a small period, tend to organize the dynamics and I will explain a bit better what I mean by that in a minute. And the other thing is related to what is called periodic orbit theory. So now what is an orbit? So the trajectory, like the one I've drawn before, is in physical space. So in this case it will be R2 or part of R2. Now phase space is a higher dimensional space so which contains positions which are in R2 but also velocities or momenta which are also in R2. So, so actually here this is a part of four dimensional space. There is one simplification, however, because velocities keep the same norm, so the speed is constant. And this means that I can actually describe my state by the xy coordinates of position and the angle alpha that the velocity vector makes with a given direction. So actually uh, I can do with three dimensions and one way in which you can look at this is to say it's a bit like having a skyscraper that has a kind of a shape of a solid uh, cylinder and the base of this cylinder is the shape of my billiard and the vertical direction is the angle in which I move and so uh, what happens here is that on each floor you're only allowed to move in one direction so maybe on the ground floor you're only allowed to move north on the first floor maybe you call it second floor you're only allowed to move south or northeast on the next floor you're only allowed to move east and so on and so forth However, you have elevators on the side of this building that allow you to change floor. Why is this useful? It's useful because, as we've seen before, trajectories, they can cross. However, orbits cannot cross because of this fact that there's one direction for each uh, floor, for each vertical component. Now, what is periodic orbit theory? Well, that's not something I'm going to explain here, but it has to do with finding some statistical properties of complicated dynamical systems. Some of these quantities can be written as sums over periodic orbits. And if you're interested in that, one person who's been doing a lot on that theory is Predrag Svitanovic. He's at Georgia Tech and he's given also uh, 
online lectures on that, so you might want to check them out if you're interested. All right, so let's now look at one example, which is the billiard in a circle. So this is a very particular example. It's not representative of the general case, but it's useful to understand it in detail. So I've drawn here a part of a trajectory. So uh, let's say it starts at this point here, x0, y0. And then it goes on to a point x1, y1, and so on. There's one further simplification, which is that I don't really have to look at what happens between collisions with the boundary. So it's actually sufficient to know what is the angle phi naught here when I start, and what is the direction theta naught here. And that should allow me to compute the next angle, phi 1, and the next angle, theta 1, and so on. Well, that's actually very easy here because you see we have a nice isosceles triangle between the middle of the circle and the two points here. So in particular, these angles here are the same. But this means that this angle here is also theta naught. And since this angle is again the same by the law of reflection, I see that actually theta 1 is equal to theta naught. And the other thing I know is I can compute phi 1 minus phi naught. Because I just use the fact that the sum of the angles of a triangle is pi. So what is this sum? It's phi 1 minus phi naught plus twice this angle here. And this angle here is pi over 2 minus theta naught. That should be equal to pi. And that allows me to find phi 1 in terms of phi naught and theta naught. So phi 1 is simply phi naught uh, plus 2 uh, theta naught. And then I can do the same to find uh, phi 1, theta 1, and so on and so forth. Let me do one more simplification, which is to say uh, that I will call Sn the variable phi n divided by 2 pi, and that is just to uh, have values which are between 0 and 1 instead of having them between 0 and 2 pi. So the way I can uh, write my, my map is that Sn plus 1 is Sn plus, okay, I, I have to divide the phi relation by 2 pi, so it's plus 1 over pi theta n, and theta n plus 1 should be equal to theta n. There's one thing missing here. Uh, I want my s ends to be between 0 and 1, because they are actually angles divided by 2 pi. So I can achieve this by adding modulo 1 here, which simply means that I only take the fractional part. So I remove the integer part. Every time the result is larger than 1, I remove 1 or any integer until I am between uh, the value 0 and 1 again. So now I can compute periodic orbits. So what do I have to take for the initial values to have an orbit of period q, where q is any integer larger equal to? Well, what I need is that S Q is equal to S naught and theta Q should be equal to theta naught. However, the second relation, the theta rela relation is already satisfied because theta is constant. And the first relation gives me that uh, S naught 
plus so that will be q over pi theta naught modulo 1 should be equal to s naught. So I've used the fact here that you can check that it's the same to take modulo 1 at each step or to do it just once at the end of the procedure. So that's why sq we have this expression s naught plus q over pi theta naught modulo 1. But what do I do with the modulo 1 here? Okay, first thing I can simplify by s naught here. But then uh, this is actually equivalent to saying that q over pi theta naught should be equal to p, where p is some integer, which could be in principle any integer. Or in other words, it means that theta naught over pi should be given by p over q, that is a rational number. So uh, the summary here is that I have two possibilities. So either theta naught over pi is of the form p over q, so it's a rational number. And then I have a periodic trajectory or orbit of period q. Or so that is the first case, or second case, theta naught over pi is irrational. And what happens then? Well, uh, one could expect maybe that in that case, s, the values of s, just take all possible values between 0 and 1. That's not quite the case, but we have the next best thing. We have that the orbit, the set of values of s, is dense in the circle. And this means that actually I can get as close as I want to any point on the circle. So in mathematical notation, I have that for all s in 0, 1, uh, for all epsilon positive, there exists an n, an iterate n, such that s n minus s will be smaller than epsilon. Okay, but in what follows, we only need to worry about periodic orbits. So uh, this dense orbit was just uh, an additional piece of information, but I'm not going to use it afterward. So one thing uh, that is important about this p over q here, we will call this the rotation number. So let's look at some examples. I've plotted a few periodic trajectories in the circle here, and let's look at their rotation number. So in the first example here, I have an orbit of period 2, just bounces back and forth, and it does half a turn between bounces. So here the rotation number will be 1 half. In the second case, the period is 3, and I do actually, so I, one way of saying is, it is that this angle here is pi over 3, or another way to say it is that uh, s will be will increase by one third turn after each uh, iteration. So here my rotation number will be one third. And the other case, uh, I just take the same trajectory but in reverse, and that means that my rotation number is equal to two thirds. Now for period four, I have something similar. So here I have rotation number one quarter. Here I have three quarter and I didn't draw two quarters because two quarters is the same as one half and one half we have already here. Now things get more interesting for higher periods. So for period five we have actually four possible cases which are 
one fifth rotation number, two fifths, three fifths, and four fifths. So you see that uh, for periods three and four, the two possible types of uh, trajectories are the same except that I change the, the direction, but for period five I really have two different types of uh, trajectories. One of them looks like a pentagon, the other like a pentagram. And you can now imagine what happens for higher periods. So let's also look at uh, what the phase space in, in general will, will look like. So this is an excerpt of a video. I put a link in the description. Uh, that is what happens for the circle. So for the circle, our orbits are parts of horizontal lines. However, if now I deform the circle to an ellipse, I get the following thing. So you see it's already more complicated. And I can now explain what I meant before by saying that periodic trajectories organize the dynamics. There are some special points here. For instance, I take this point here and this point here. They form a an orbit of period two, and the trajectory is actually this one, going along the minor axis of my ellipse. And there's another orbit of period two, which consists in these two points here, and that one corresponds to the major axis of the ellipse. So these somehow survive to, uh, so from the situation of the circle, but in the circle I had actually an, uh, an uncountable infinity of trajectories of period two because I could choose as not whichever way I wanted. And here I only have two values of as not that give me orbits of period uh, two. Now, when I said that these orbits organize phase space, you see what happens on, on this uh, picture. It, it, if you know the phase portrait of uh, the pendulum, it looks a bit similar. And in the pendulum, you have two different motions. So one of them is the pendulum just oscillating back and forth. And the other one is the pendulum that makes full turns. And in between, you have a motion where the pendulum just goes from the vertical position back to the vertical position in infinite time. So it's a bit similar here. So the, uh, the minor axis is uh, actually similar to the position where the pendulum is, is just uh, pointing downward. And then you have the small oscillations around this position, which are these circles like here. And uh, so this, the, these kinds of circles here. And then you have the other orbits uh, which go around. And so on the, on the billiard, on the, so if you look at the trajectories, they correspond to those trajectories that remain between the focal points, which are here and here. And the others correspond to those that move around the focal points. All right, but now we want to do something similar for more general convex billiards. So again, let me use this uh, convention. So let me draw just part of a trajectory. So I start with the position S0, then I arrive at S1, then I go on to S2 and so on. And let me measure the angles theta0, theta1 and so on. So I move this way and that way. And now, okay, there's one little thing I will uh, still change in, in my notation is that instead of working with theta n, 
I'm going to work with un, which is minus the cosine of theta n. And I will explain why uh, this is useful. So now un goes from minus 1 to 1. And I've put the minus sign uh, because I want un to increase if theta n increases. Now, I still have my map here. So let's put Sn here, Un here. So Sn, let's say, goes again from 0 to 1. So S is, uh, in this case, S will be the arc length. Okay, divided by the total length of the boundary. So S will go from 0 to 1. And the first property I'm, I'm going to emphasize here is that my map, so my map is the map that maps Sn un to Sn plus 1 un plus 1. So this map is actually continuous. What does it mean? One way of saying it is that if I take a certain set here of uh, initial values, something like that, it will be mapped by T to uh, another set, which may be here. But uh, if the initial set is uh, connected, so it's in one piece, then its image will be connected as well. So T doesn't cut my uh, set in small pieces. And you see, uh, for that it's important to have a convex boundary, because if my boundary did something like that, I could have the situation where I... Uh, so in one case I, I hit here. And if I change the angle a little bit, suddenly I hit here, so I can have discontinuities. And also corners will lead to discontinuities in the angle. Okay, so if the boundary is smooth, so there's a tangent vector everywhere, and convex, my map T is continuous. And another property is that actually T is area preserving. So, this means that the area of the first set here and of its image here are the same. And that's the reason why I introduced this variable u here. So, for now I'm going to ask you to trust me on this, but at the very end I'm going to give a quick outline on how you show that this map is area preserving. All right, so here's now the main result I want to present today, which is the following. So I have a convex billiard without corners. So as I said, what I mean by this is that uh, there is a tangent vector So at each point on the boundary. And this is uh, so to have a continuous map. And the claim is that for such a billiard there are at least two periodic trajectories for every rational number so of the form p over q between 0 and 1. And here I always ask that the fraction p over q be irreducible. So p and q should be co-prime. Their greatest common divisors should be 1, because otherwise I have this thing like uh, rotation number 2 over 4, which is the same as 1 over 2.
Okay, but that's our, our result. So for any p over q, rational between 0 and 1, I have at least two periodic trajectories with that rotation number. So uh, this theorem is known as Poincaré-Birkhoff theorem. It's one way of uh, stating this theorem. So who were uh, Poincaré and Birkhoff? So Henri Poincaré was a French mathematician who is very well known for his many contributions to mathematics and other sciences. He's considered one of the last uh, polymath, so in the sense that he really knew about every area of mathematics at his time and made important contributions to all of them. So there are many results that bear his name. And he is one of the people who started developing this geometric approach to uh, dynamical systems. And George Birkhoff was an uh, American mathematician who uh, spent most of his career at Harvard. And he uh, liked very much the met methods of Henri Poincaré and he uh, improved them. So for instance, uh, Henri Poincaré uh, proved the first version of this uh, result I just showed you, but in a more restrictive case, and uh, David Birkhoff uh, found a generalization of that. And apart from that, uh, George Birkhoff is mostly known for the domain of mathematics called ergodic theory. He is one or maybe even its main founding fathers. So ergodic theory is useful to uh, study statistical properties of dynamical systems. So uh, I'm going now to give you not one but actually two proofs of uh, this result. The first one is a bit simpler, it's based on geometrical considerations and the properties of continuous functions. So before I do that let me uh, we call uh, or explain uh, a few important properties of continuous functions. So here is a quite well-known uh, problem that if you have ever had a lecture on basic analysis or topology, you probably have seen one version of, uh, of the story. So it's the story of a hiker, so let's call her Helen. And so she's going on a two-day hike. And what she does is that on day one, she starts at a given time. Let's say that she starts at, one, uh, at 8 a.m. And uh, let's say that she uh, starts at the foot of a small mountain or hill and uh, goes all the way to the top. But uh, she is in no particular hurry, so she knows the weather forecast is good and there are lots of sights to enjoy along the way and she looks at uh, plants and animals and takes pictures, makes a break for lunch, maybe after lunch even uh, realizes uh, she has forgotten something and doubles back. But anyway, she arrives, let's say, at 4 p.m. And there uh, she maybe pitches her tent or maybe there's an inn and she spends the, the night there. And on day two, she goes back down the mountain and again she starts at 8 a.m. and she arrives at 4 p.m. But apart from that, maybe she does uh, things in a completely different way than on day one. So maybe she walks very fast at some places where she was slow on the day before and uh, the other way around in other places. And the claim is that whatever she does, there's at least one particular point at which she will be at the exact same time on day one and on day two. And how do you show that? Well, 
you use properties of continuous functions. So here I have time, here I have position, and on both days I start at 8 a.m. and I stop at uh, 4 p.m. And on day one, day one, so, okay, maybe she started fast and then she slowed down and then she, she stops quite often and uh, then she makes a lunch break, then she returns because uh, she has forgotten something and, okay, finally she arrives at, uh, at the top of the mountain at 4 p.m. So that is day one. And on day two, so she starts here, so at uh, here at 8 a.m. And she does something completely different. Okay, so maybe she goes first slow and then fast and uh, okay. But you see, whatever she does, there is at least one point where she crosses her path of the day before. So there's one particular point, at least one, where she will be at the same time as on the day before. There could be more. And the other, the only thing we have used here is that her position as a function of time is continuous, so she doesn't have a teleporter, so she's not able to suddenly be beamed up to, to the summit, then this argument wouldn't work. And there are many other examples of applications of continuity. For instance, uh, one thing is that at any given time, there are at least two antipodal points on the Earth that have exactly the same temperature. Also two points that have the same pressure and so on. That's also an application of continuity. So uh, now we want to do something similar, but for our uh, two-dimensional map. And the idea is the following. So let me start here uh, at some position on the boundary S0. And let me look at trajectories that have different angles. So I vary theta from 0 to pi or u from minus 1 to 1. So I'm just going to draw a few of these trajectories. So they look like this. And you see uh, the important thing here is that S1, so the position after, uh, so the position of my next bounds here, is an increasing function of my angle theta naught here. So if I plot here S and here U, what I did, what I just obtained, is that uh, if I start with a certain uh, vertical line here, which is at position S naught, what will be the image of this vertical line? Well, it has to tilt to the right because I have this property that, so the derivative, partial derivative of S1 with respect to U0 is positive. So this is called a twist map. So the image of this vertical line segment is going to look maybe something like this. So it it could go up and down depending on where you start and what the shape is. But you see that when the angle goes from uh, 0 to pi, so u goes from minus 1 to 1, s will turn exactly once around my, my cylinder. So you have to Imagine that this side is actually glued together with this one. So my face space is actually a cylinder. Now, 
how does this uh, help us to uh, find periodic orbits? So let, uh, let us look uh, again at uh, so the SU plane here. You see, if, if I do now the same, but uh, not for the map T iterated once, but for T iterated twice. So if I look for an, an orbit of period two, it means that I, I look for a pair SU such that T squared of SU, so that is T of T of SU, is equal to SU. So if I find such a pair as u, then I have my starting point for my orbit of period 2. Now uh, let us look at uh, what happens for t square. So again, let me start with some position s not here. Now if I apply t twice, what I will do is that I will actually uh, the upper point here will turn twice around the boundary. So uh, it's a bit harder to draw, but it will be something that does maybe this. Like this and le then like this. And the point here is that, again, this line here and this curve cross at some point. So what does it mean? So this line winding twice around the cylinder is the image after two iteration of my vertical line. So it doesn't mean that this point is a fixed point of t squared, but it does mean that maybe I started from here. So that was my point S naught U naught. And it is mapped to this point here, S2 U2. And S1, U1 is somewhere else, uh, I don't really care. But with S2 equals S0. So at least I have found uh, a starting point such that the S coordinate doesn't change, but the U coordinate can still change. But now uh, the argument is you do the same for all possible values of S0. And what happens then? So I will draw for uh, each value of S0 the points S0 U0 and S0 U2. And this will then give a picture that looks maybe like this. Something like this. And perhaps something like this. And so what I've drawn here is, so maybe before I had here my point S0, U0, and it was mapped vertically to this point S0, U2. And then if I start maybe with uh, another point here, so that would be S0 prime, U0 prime, it will be mapped vertically to this point here, which is again S0 prime and U2 prime. Now you see these two curves, like I have drawn them, they do cross each other. Uh, why do they have to do that? Well, that is related to the fact that my map T is area preserving. So if one curve were under the other, it would mean that the area between the curve and the bottom here would change. And since this is not possible, the two, the two curves have to cross. And they have to cross at least twice. They could cross more times. Actually, for the case of the circle, the two lines would be identical because u doesn't change at all. But in any case, I will have at least two intersections here. And uh, this is exactly uh, what you use to, to prove the result, because now 
I have found two points here, which are indeed uh, invariant under t squared. So I have found here, so this point here and this point here, they, call, they give me two periodic orbits of period two. And their rotation number will necessarily be one half because it's the only possibility for period two. And now you see how you can generalize this to period three. So for period three, well, uh, let me take again a vertical line here. And then what will its image look like? Well, again, it will tilt to the right, but it has now to wrap three times around my uh, cylinder. So that's even harder to draw, but let me try. So it will do something like this and something like that and like this and like that. And you see now I have two intersection points. So this means I have, for each S naught here, I have at least, even exactly, two points which are moved vertically. And now uh, if I do this for all possible values of S naught, what I will have again is, okay, one curve here, which is mapped to a uh, another curve here and uh, a little bit higher up I have will have another curve here which is mapped to another curve uh, I started above so it should do something like that and this means that okay again I have uh, well at least two or maybe more so here I have drawn more I have a certain number of intersection points and they correspond actually, you can see, so that would be rotation number one third and that would be rotation number two thirds. And the same argument works for uh, you know, higher periods as well. So this is the first proof of the Poincaré-Birkhoff theorem. Now I told you that there is another proof and before uh, saying more about that let's just come back to the ellipse. So one thing you may have noticed is that I talked about these orbits or trajectories of period two uh, and they are actually the semi-axis or the not the semi the axis of the ellipse so the major and minor axis of the ellipse. Now it's quite easy to see that the major axis here is actually the longest uh, line connecting two points between, uh, so on the boundary of the ellipse. Uh, now how about the minor axis here? Is it is it the shortest? Well, no, it can't be the shortest because the shortest line between two points would have length zero, right? So if I move my two points on the boundary, some, if the two points are the same, then the length is zero. So the question is, uh, what happens, uh, what is the property of this minor axis of the ellipse in terms of length. So let me uh, let me explain like this. So in general for you know two points with coordinates s0 and s1 what we can do is draw the line between these points and compute the length. So this line will have a length and this length let me denote it L of S0 S1. So I have now a function of two variables and 
I'm going to look at derivatives of this function. So my claim is that uh, actually the derivatives of L with respect to its two arguments will give me information on the angles. So these angles, let me call them theta naught. And this one, okay, I won't call it theta one, not to confuse it with the angle after the reflection, so let me call it theta one prime. So my claim is the following. It is that if I take the partial derivative of L with respect to its first argument, which I'm going to denote like that, so that will be actually u naught, which is by definition minus cosine theta naught. And so the partial derivative of the length with respect to the second variable will be minus u uh, one prime, which is uh, cosine of theta one prime. So we say that L is a generating function for the angles, or for the map, the bouncing map, that goes from S0 theta0 to S1 and uh, theta1 prime or theta1. So generating functions are used all over mathematics. So uh, for instance, they appear in probability when you look at moment generating functions of random variables. So these are functions whose derivatives give you moments of uh, the random variable, like the expectation, the variance, and so on. OK, now let me uh, explain uh, the idea of why this is true. So the idea is that, let me move a little bit around along the boundary, like this, to S0 plus some delta S0. And let me look at this new length here. So uh, now the length here would be L of, so I can write it either as L of S0 plus delta S0 S1, but I actually want to write it as L of S0 S1 minus some small delta L. So you see in my drawing here uh, it is a little bit shorter. So what is delta L? Well the, the idea is that if you know I have here a triangle with, uh, with uh, one very short side and two very long sides, so a very thin angle here, but I'm going to focus on what happens here? And what happens here is that I have something like this, which is almost uh, a triangle with a, with a white angle here. So what I have here is one side equal to delta S0, and here another side given by delta L. And here I have the angle theta naught. And now you see what happens is, uh, so this is approximately true when delta S and delta L are non-zero, but when you take them smaller and smaller, uh, you will really have uh, a triangle like this. And what I can write is that the cosine of theta naught is equal, okay, so, uh, yeah, so this will be equal to delta L over delta S naught. But this, uh, okay, this is equal to minus U naught. But this delta L over delta S naught, it will converge as delta S naught goes to zero to the derivative of L with respect to S0, but I have a minus sign here because uh, the length is a little bit shorter in my case. 
And something similar happens in, in, in the other situation. So if I move S1 a little bit, well, you will see that you will get this other relation here. Now, uh, what does this have to do with, uh, with my problem? Well, let's look at, again, uh, let's say, the trajectory of period 3, like this. So it hits the boundary at points S0, S1, S2. Okay, but let's uh, not assume that this is a periodic trajectory. So what I mean is that I have an angle theta naught here, and I have an angle theta naught prime, which could be different. And again, here I have theta 1, here I have theta 1 prime, which could be different, here I have theta 2, and theta 2 prime. Now if the uh, corresponding angles are equal, then I know that I will have a periodic trajectory. But let me look now at the following function, g of s naught, s1, s2, which is given by L of s naught, s1, plus L of s1, s2, plus L of s2, s naught. And let me compute the derivatives of this g with respect to the different uh, variables. So to each theta I have a u, so uh, I have ui is minus cos theta i, ui prime is minus cos theta i prime. So what is the derivative of g with respect to s naught? Well, I have this guy and this guy that depend on s naught. And OK, you have to be careful with notation. So if I take the derivative with respect to s naught, uh, I said before that here I will get u naught. So the sign was a uh, plus sign here. But here I will get minus uh, u naught prime because s naught is in the second position here as an argument. Now, in the same spirit, if I take the de derivative with respect to s1, what I get here is minus u1 prime and plus u1. And finally, for S2, what I get is uh, here I get minus U2 prime and plus U2. So I've computed here all the partial derivatives of my generating function G. And well, now when do I have a periodic orbit? So my trajectory is periodic if and only if theta naught is theta naught prime, theta one is theta one prime, theta two is theta two prime. And that is the same as having all these partial, partial derivatives equal to zero. So dg over ds naught equals dg over ds one equal to partial g, partial s2, equals 0. And here I've done this for three points, but I can do the same for any number of points. So this, uh, a point satisfying this is called a critical point. So S0, S1, S2 is a critical point of G. Now, a critical point could be a maximum, it could be a minimum, but it can also be something else, and we are going to see what. 
So now let me give you a proof of uh, the Poincaré Birkhoff theorem for period two. So uh, for period two, what happens? So I have my G of S not S1. That's L of S not S1 plus L of S1 S not. Okay, but these two are by symmetry are equal. So it's just twice the length of S0, S1. Now, what do I know about this length? Well, it, it is a norm, it is a, a, a distance. So I know that it is non-negative and I know that it is equal to zero if and only if S0 and S1 are equal. So if I plot now S0 here, S1 here, I have a function which is continuous and it is zero on the diagonal. So here I have L of S0, S1 equals zero. If S1 is equal to S0. And I've also included the point here and the point here because remember everything is periodic. So this side you have to glue to this one and this one you have to glue to this one. So now I have a continuous non-negative function and actually it is strictly positive here and here. So what I can always say for such a function is that it will reach a maximal value. Okay, that's another property of continuous functions. So if I know that the function does not go to infinity and it's positive, it's a zero on the boundary of some uh, bounded domain, then it has, it will reach its maximum. So let's say that it is maximal here. So here L is maximal. So here I, I have a, a maximum. So so this is a particular point, uh, example of critical point, right? So it's it gives me a critical point, and so it gives me an orbit and a trajectory of period two. So I've already shown that I have found one uh, orbit of period two. But I need to find another one because the claim is that I have at least two of these. So how do I find the other one? Well, first of all, uh, I have to use that L of S0 S1 is equal to L of S1 S0. So it means that if I take the symmetric point here, then this is also a maximum. Just by symmetry. And now I remember that everything is periodic. So if I do this, so I just put another copy here. So we said that we had here S0, S1. So I have one maximum. So let's say it was here. So there L is max. I have a copy here. But this point here also appears here. Right, so all these three points are maxima of my length function. But what happens if I have two, I have a function which is no negative, continuous, and it has two maxima? Well, if you are a hiker, you probably know what this means. So here is a picture of a mountaineer Banff, which I took last winter in, uh, so in the Canadian Rocky Mountains. So you see here you have this very beautiful mountain with two, two tops, two uh, summits, which have approximately the same height. Well, between these two summits, you will have actually a mountain pass or saddle. 
which we can see here. If you look at uh, Google Maps, so I have my two mountaintops here, and in between here I have a saddle or a mountain pass. So in dimension two we can quite easily visualize this, but how do we do this uh, mathematically? Well, the idea is the following. So let me take my two summits here, my two maxima, and let me take any path going from one to the other. And let me plot now, here I put L, and here I put the length, so along the path, let me call it gamma. So what do I know? So here I have it reaches its maximum at the other end it reaches its maximum and in between well it will typically it will go down it might be constant that means that i just have a, a ridge connecting the two summits and that is the case for the circle but in general uh, l will go down and it means that I have a minimal value here. Okay, and let's say this minimal minimum along this curve is here. But then I do the same for another curve. So here's another curve, and for the other curve I have another minimum here. And I do the same for all possible curves that go from one maximum to the other. And so now I do an, uh, another plot where here, okay, there are actually an infinite number of curves, so it's, it's not at all one dimensional, but just to, to get the idea, I plot here the value of the minimum, the minimal length along the curve in terms of the curve. Well, this uh, at some point has to reach a maximal value here. And this is where my saddle is. So once again, uh, what is the saddle? We can also see it on the picture here. So what I did is I took one curve going like this. And I said, okay, the minimal altitude I reach on this curve is here. And then I did this with another curve, which is maybe like this. And the minimal altitude I reach is this. And I do this for all curves. And what I say is that among all these curves, well, there will be curves for which the minimum is actually my saddle. So. The value of L at the saddle is the highest value of all the lowest values I get along curves. And this is what we wanted because now I know that somewhere here in between I have a saddle. So here I have a saddle. And of course I have copies uh, by symmetry here and and here and here. But this means that I have at, at least two critical points of my length function. So two uh, so critical points of my generating function. They give me two periodic orbits, two periodic trajectories. Now, the same can be done in higher periods. The only difficulty is that we don't want just two trajectories for any given period. We actually want two trajectories for every rotation number. But the, uh, the solution here is that we just do 
things a bit more carefully in terms of how the points are uh, put on the boundary. So I will take the order into account. So <coughs> what I mean is the following. So here, let's say I, I take points on the boundary which have a cyclic order. So let's say they are numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So I have a cyclic order like this, but I can also have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And now I look at the generating function, which is, uh, so it will be uh, g of s, <coughs> so maybe s1, s2, up to s5. but only on the set of configurations with this cyclic order. And then <clears throat> my argument gives me two uh, critical points for that. But then I do the same for uh, points which are ordered like that. Uh, so three is here, four, five. Right, or it could be one, uh, two, uh, three, four, and again on the set of configurations with this particular order I find my two periodic orbits and I can do the same for any period and for any arrangement of points and uh, so this gives me a second way of showing this result by Poincaré and Burke. Okay, so one last thing. I promised you a proof of, at least the idea of a proof of uh, why this map T uh, is area preserving. So this map T was the map that goes from S0 U0 to S1 U1. And uh, so I've seen that I have this function L of S0, S1, and DL over DS0 gives me U0, and DL over DS1 gives me minus U1. And okay, now I am writing U1 instead of U1 prime because I'm assuming that I am on, uh, on a particular orbit. Now, one way of writing this, and I'm going to use differentials, is that dl is dl over ds0 du0 plus uh, dl over ds1 du1. Okay. Uh, with a minus sign here. Okay, so uh, now the idea is to take uh, one more derivative of this relation. So, you see, if I take this relation here, what I can write is that du0 is equal to uh, the second derivative of L with respect to S0, ds0, uh, plus the, the second derivative with respect to S0 and S1, uh, ds1. And now just to simplify notations, let me write this as L 0, 0, ds0 plus L uh, 0, 1, ds1. And I can do the same for du1. 
So what I have is that du not du one is equal to a certain matrix times ds not ds one. And this matrix is given, so I already have the first line, so that is L0, L0, one And here I will have minus L10 and minus L11. And now the idea is to invert partially the system to get ds1, d1, in terms of ds0 and d u0. Okay, and if you do that, uh, you get something uh, like this. So I have 1 over L01. And by the way, I can divide by L01 because of this twist map property. So remember this twist map property told me that uh, d s1 over d u0 is positive. And this quantity is exactly my L01. And now if I uh, complete my computation here, I will have uh, here L0, 0, 1, L11, one, one, and here I will get L0, 1 squared minus L0, 0, zero L11. One, one. So you have to, to do the computation. But the point is that the determinant of this matrix here is equal to 1. And that implies that my map is area preserving. All right, so that's it for today. Thanks for watching. Take care. Bye.